Veterans Chronicles is sponsored by the state of Qatar, representing Qatar's commitment to the U.S. Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. I'm honored to be joined today by World War II U.S. Army veteran George Champa. He served in the 607th Graves Registration Company. He's also a veteran of D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. And sir, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Where were you born and raised, sir? I was uh, born in Boston, Massachusetts. We left there when I was nine years old, and the uh, whole family moved to California in a 1932 Chevrolet. And when did you join the service? I went in the service uh, November 23rd of uh, 1943. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I tried to enlist in the Air Corps. I tried two times, and uh, my eyes were 2022, and I couldn't make it. The first time the doctor said, eat a lot of carrots and come back. I tried that. I was working for Douglas Aircraft, and also got working on Navy SBD dive bombers, and uh, felt that I wanted to get in the Air Corps. My brother and my brother-in-law were in the Air Corps, and I thought that was a thing to do, especially after being around those airplanes and towing them out on a tarmac and doing all the finishing touches and sit in the cockpit. Imagine you're flying one of these things. And uh, so anyway, I flunked it twice. The doctor said, uh, the second time he said, just think maybe I'd get killed if you went in the Air Corps. The way it turned out, I had a close uh, call with death a, a number of times. So once you joined, were you originally signed to the Graves Registration Company? Yeah, I was. I, I was originally signed to the 610th Graves Registration Company. And when I heard that, I just about flipped because as a little kid, I had a big fear of death because of a few things that happened in the family that were very emotional. The little cousin, first of all, uh, cemetery burial, very emotional. So I got a big fear of death as a little kid. Uh, so... Uh, when I heard that word graves, I said, oh, my God, you know, what, what are we going to be doing? So we, we had a regular infantry training in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Then we had to attend a uh, autopsy at a hospital in Denver. And I stood <laughs> way in the back of the room. But uh, anyway, I, I, got, uh, I got in a 610th, and then I kept trying to figure out how to get out of it. I and another fellow. And it was a bunch of pretty young guys on the 610th. So what happened one day, the uh, base next to, which, next to us, which was the Army Air Corps base, uh, they came over to, to uh, recruit pilots because in March of 44, that's a few months before D-Day, uh, they were really hurting for pilots. And so they lowered the eye requirements. Nobody knows us except me. To 2030, no glasses. And I knew I could pass that. And so I didn't even check with my company commander. I just signed up and then went through the whole thing. You get letters from your teachers, you know, reference letters and all that. And so they accepted me. They notified the company commander and he blew his top and he uh, transferred me out of the 610th, 610th to the 607th <laughs> that was going overseas immediately. And they were short one guy. So I was a replacement. And the guys were all older than I was, so I didn't know any of them. And on the way overseas, they're all kidding me. Don't worry, chop I can turn a ship around and take you home. Roosevelt said, no 18-year-old will set foot on foreign soil. And uh, that's the, the fact from his speech. But anyway, of course, I kept going with them, and uh, we landed in, in England. And it all started from there overseas. What does the training consist of? A regular infantry training. You go through the... What they call them the courses, right? Uh, but did they train you on how to handle the bodies no, ahead no, of time? No. no, the only the only training we got there is a watch autopsy to see. That's the only thing. That's okay. a, that's it. Okay. Other than that, it was all infantry training and freezing cold weather. This is in uh, in uh, the end of November. This is December, January. Wyoming is very very cold. You're going. You're trying to to uh, shoot on the firing range with gloves on and, and you're, 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 you're freezing cold, very windy cold. Then Normandy was the first time Well, let me lead you into that. What, sure. what happened then is uh, uh, we got to uh, Oxford, England, and uh, then they split up our company. We had 124 enlisted men and officers. They split the company up into platoons. 
1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th platoon in headquarters. And uh, we went to, our platoon went to Bristol, England. And then from Bristol, we went to St. Austell, which is at Land's End in, in England, down by the ports. And, uh, and, but before we even got there, we learned what happened to our first platoon. They were on an exercise called Exercise Tiger. You can read about it in a couple of books. And Exercise Tiger was a practice landing on the beach that was going to come up. And so we had uh, our first platoon. Uh, we lost 18 guys. We lost a first lieutenant, master sergeant, sergeants, corporals, and five privates, ironically, survived. And a couple of them got discharges, Section 8 discharges. And one of them jumped off of a porch. And Anyway, they couldn't talk about it. They got put in a barbed wire area and said, keep your mouth shut about this. Uh, Eisenhower has gave it ordered for uh, the officers to be found because they had papers on them showing maps where we were going to land. And so there were almost uh, 800 people, with guys killed. What happened is we had four LSTs out there practicing this. this uh, they were working uh, with actually live ammunition, uh, like they were landing, you know. But what happened is a uh, German e-boat sunk three of the four ships, torpedoed them. It, almost 800 guys were killed just like that, bam, before the invasion even started. Now we lost some of our friends. We thought, this is no dry run. You know, this is for real. We're in a war. And so it scared the hell out of us. And so then uh, when it's time for us to go to the invasion, we were on a ship and we were out there. And I meet a guy on a, on a ship that was a Navy gunner. My age took me into his quarters, showed me around. That night while we're sleeping, there's a huge explosion, and the ship is rocking like crazy, and we're all running up on deck from the, down in the hold where we were sleeping. And uh, come to find out, a German torpedo plane dropped a, a torpedo to our ship, but it didn't get to our ship. The gunner shot the plane down. And anyway, it caused a huge explosion, so the ship really was rocking. And so... That was our first in, encounter uh, with death. And then we get to the area where there's four or 5,000 ships. There's different reports on how many were out there. And we were anchored there, uh, broadside to shore. And uh, we could hear the German artillery called 88s. They scream. We call them screaming memes. And as they're going over, the, over you, uh, you can hear them screaming. And they're hitting ships, and we can see ships getting hit. And we can see bodies in the water and debris. And then uh, I saw a, a tanker blow up. And so they had all these targets out there, and uh, they were hitting a lot of them. And so uh, all of us got on the opposite side from the shore on a ship against the bulkhead, you know, the bulkhead is, mm -hmm. to get some protection in case our ship got hit from the shore side and waited to go down the rope ladders. Seemed like hours. I have no idea how long it was. Uh, I wasn't timing anything. I had no idea. It was very frightening. We didn't know when we were going to get a hit. So then we get in the rope ladders and go down, and we get into it. Um, LCI, landing craft, that's the smaller one. You know, LSTs, the larger ones. And we got in that, and we started to head in the shore. And uh, we got part way in, and we could hear the 88 screaming over us, they turned the, turned the landing craft around and went back out a ways, and then we started in again, and you could hear that art, artillery just screaming over us. And I thought for years it was because they thought we were going to get hit, so they kept turning around. But I, I found out the reason they were turning around, because we went in the third time, is that uh, the Germans had obstacles in the water. And uh, to keep you from, uh, you know, these obstacles, a lot of them had mines attached to them, barbed wire and all. And so uh, when we, they were trying to keep you from getting into the shore, we finally got in. And then, you know, by that time, I'm pretty damn scared. And I don't even remember getting off the LCI. I don't, can't remember that. And my wife has told me, don't even think about it because it might bring back 
bad memories, but I've thought about it, and, and I, all I know is pretty soon we're picking up bodies. And, uh, and we have a service company attached to us. We were segregated then from, from black fellows, and so they were in an organization called Service Company. I don't remember the number of the service company, but their job was to dig graves. So anyway, at first, one of our first things we did is pick up par- paratroopers who landed in the channel in error. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there were other errors. There's a lot of errors in wars. You, you, you got to, you lose a lot of battles, but you got to win a war. And that's what it's all about. It's like a football game. You know, halftime, they decide what they'd be doing wrong and hopefully win or maybe lose. So anyway, uh, we, uh, these paratroopers, they were very loaded down, and when a parachute came down over them, they'd drown. And uh, that's what happened. So many of these guys drowned. You know, a lot of paratroopers got shot while they're still in the air. You know, but uh, uh, these guys, we wrapped them in their parachutes and, and, and buried them. After a couple of days, uh, we had German prisoners quickly. And so we had the prisoners digging the graves. So these guys didn't have anything to do anymore. That was the end of their work, but it's still over there. So the rest of the war, for 11 months, every day, we, we established 17 temporary cemeteries throughout France, Belgium, and Germany. And uh, we, we handled about 75,000 bodies in, the, in that time in five campaigns, France, Belgium, and Germany. And we picked up, that's Germans as well as Americans, because the Germans didn't pick up their dead. We did. We buried them in separate cemeteries, the same way as we buried the Americans, in mattress covers, six feet down in the dirt. Mr. Chapa, let's take a quick break right there. We'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Army World War II veteran George Chapa. He was a member of the 607th Graves Registration Company. And, sir, you were just talking about uh, the paratroopers and then collecting bodies of both allies and uh, Germans on D-Day and wrapping them in mattress covers in temporary cemeteries. What was the, the protocol for keeping things organized, identifying soldiers, keeping track of their effects, and so forth? Okay, well, it's all pretty complicated. But we, first of all, I was 18 years old. I was a skinny kid. I weighed about 112 pounds. i never been away from home. Couldn't swim. Not that that would help you. But anyway, we, uh, we were attached to the combat engineers uh, uh, going in. Our company, uh, two platoons at Omaha, two platoons at Utah. Headquarters came later, so we had to get provisions from somewhere. So we got them from from the uh, uh, combat engineers that landed there, and uh, and then uh, the protocol uh, in picking these bodies up for eleven months. What we did was we try to determine how they were killed for the paperwork. Headquarters did the paperwork where they were killed, how they were killed, when they were killed. Uh, and then we had to take the personal effects from them and throw anything that was bloodied away uh, because these personal effects are going back to the families. First of all, they're, they're in, a, in a little olive drab bag with a tie with a label on it. It goes to Kansas where it's all processed, and then they send that stuff home to the next of kin. So we didn't want them getting any bloodied stuff. So... Uh, so, so that's the protocol. Uh, oh, somebody, uh, certainly a better pay grade than I was, determined where the cemeteries were, would be. So they'd pick out a spot, plot of ground, and, and, and that's where usually we'd have a, a cemetery on one side of the road and a German cemetery on the other side of the road. And so uh, we had a code of ethics, you know, nobody took anything that didn't belong to them. And, uh, you know, if you saw Private Ryan, you saw a shot where these guys are all, first of all, they were eating a sandwich, weren't even holding a rifle, supposed to be on D-Day. And the other thing was, uh, there's a group of guys going through dog tags, and they're reading off the names. Did you see that movie? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. uh, I think you have an Italian name, as I do. I'm Greek, but... uh, You're Greek? Yes. Okay, well, what they were doing is another WAP, when they come to an Italian name... Mm-hmm. And that shocked me. I was going to write to Spielberg. Or they'd like to say another Jew or another kike or something like that. Uh, that was not good. Uh, but that's what they did in that movie. Other than that, it was a pretty good movie. It was probably more realistic than any other, except 
it showed one landing craft coming in and what happened, you know, looking for Private Ryan. But, you know, there's thousands of, of landing craft going going in and, and you're just seeing one little, little part, which which I understand. Yeah, because I do films. I, I've been doing documentaries for 13 years. I just did a documentary in June about the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I took seven other D-Day veterans along with American Airlines flying us over there. And I had to uh, raise money for all the other expenses, a lot of them. But anyway, uh, getting back to what I was saying, uh, you know, we we weren't eating sandwiches. We had K rations, and uh, and uh, and you didn't have an officer with the markings on his helmet. No way, right? As they did in Private Ryan. So you know, it's Hollywood, right? And uh, but anyway, it uh, uh, we did this through the the stench of it all in Normandy. Getting in your clothing, your mouth is dry from spitting. You sleep in that clothing with that stench because you slept in my clothes and my boots, you know, in a, in a foxhole if you, could, if, you, if you had one. We did this every day with the stench until we got to the Battle of the Bulge. And then you had frozen bodies, frozen ground. Then you had to go through the, the, the ice. We had prisoners with jackhammers going through the ice before they could get to the dirt to dig a grave. That land was taken from farmers, and it wasn't until two years after the war those farmers got that land back, and all those bodies uh, were put in a t- permanent cemetery. Those were built in '47, two years after the war. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the the temporary cemetery, the last one we had in Belgium, just before we went to uh, Germany, uh, was uh, uh, we had 17,300 buried there, Americans. And uh, and from that 17,300, when they were disinterred, they had local people doing that work and, of course, paying them to do that work. And they put these bodies in lined caskets. A lot of them were stored because of the weather, with tarps thrown over them, until they could find out from the families if they wanted the, re- the remains sent home or remain over there. So 60% of the guys that were killed over there, on the average, were sent home to any cemetery the family is designated, free cost. The other 40% remain there. So when you see a cemetery over there, like Normandy, that's almost 10,000 graves, we buried a lot of those guys in temporary graves in Normandy. We, we had temporary graves in, in the several locations in Normandy. In fact, uh, St. Mary Glees uh, Cemetery 1 and 2 had two cemeteries. There wasn't enough room in the one plot of ground. And uh, and there was a lady that was a, the wife of the mayor. She put flowers on those graves all her life. And she tried to get our government to keep those cemeteries as permanent ones. But the government said, no, they were all disinterred and put into the Omaha Cemetery. We call it the Omaha Cemetery in, in Normandy. And uh, and so we we established those those cemeteries. And when I was there in June, they rededicated that land. They put a new monument there. They had a veil. They had me unwrap it. And it's all in my film. And they did a very good program with singers and soldiers. I mean, it was, it was, it was very well done in St. Mary Glaze. Mr. Chapa, let's take one more break, and we'll be right back with the rest of your story on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, joined today by U.S. Army veteran George Chapa, served in World War II with the 607th Graves Registration Company. And Mr. Chapa, um, what was your unit doing during the battles? Were you working even as the battles went on? Yeah, we we were in harm's way a lot. We got the crowd de guerre from France for what we did, getting there early and doing what we're doing early. Years later, like seven years ago, I got this medal here, which is the highest medal France gives out with crowd uh, Legion of Honor. Right. And I'm more proud of the crowd de guerre uh, medal and also a Meritorious Service Award medal that we got in the Battle of the Bulge because when that battle started, all our units were withdrawing combat medics and we had to stay. And so that's why we got that medal. And none of these are honorary medals. They're all medals for something. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, we uh, we were in harm's way a lot. And... Uh, 
There were a lot of buzz bombs. The Germans were shooting from uh, launch pads and just hitting anywhere. And one just about got me and, and my friends. We were in, in, a, in a bivouac area in the woods, and a piece of shrapnel I have at home like this, all jagged, fell right next to my leg here. If it had hit me, you know, it would have ripped up my leg. But uh, we had, uh, we were picking up guys that were hit by buzz bombs way behind the lines on, on, when they're, you know, on a, on a uh, we call them piss calls. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but uh, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, we did. We, we had, had to work uh, a lot in harm's way, and we worked a lot with combat medics, you know, they tended to the wounded and we tended to the dead and, and at collection points where there's guys dying, you know, we were there uh, for that. And it, it was very grotesque uh, work to do. Nobody wanted to do it. I didn't want to do it. I broke down uh, once about two or three weeks in, still in Normandy. Uh, and, uh, our lieutenant pulled out his forty-five and pointed it at me, and he said, you "Get your ass out there and suck it up." And, and that's the way you know things are moving fast, and there's a war going on. And there's no babying, you know. And uh, I was a little kid, one hundred twelve pounds, and uh, but uh, you know I was a tough little kid. And uh, when Germans were digging graves, I'd stand there and say, uh, "Nix Arbeit and Nix Essen," which means don't work and don't eat. A lot of them thought they were digging their own grave, and a lot of them, you know, Nazi, me Polsky, me something else, you know. But anyway, and a lot of them were, because the Germans had a lot of uh, soldiers in the army from these countries that they occupied. You had to either be in the army or you're dead. Uh, so anyway, we had uh, the last cemetery we had was in Germany, about 100 miles from Berlin, and when the war ended in, in May, May 7th, uh, then. Uh, they had a ceremony, a Memorial Day ceremonies at the cemetery there in Eisenach. And all those graves had to be disinterred. We had German soldiers digging the graves, disinterred. We had to re-identify the remains. And by that time, it's pretty grotesque. And uh, because you got a dog tag on a body and one on, on a marker. And at that time, we just had markers or wood crosses. Other graves registration companies came in and put up, instead of our markers, they put in crosses and nailed the dog tag to, to the cross. So these bodies are all transported from, from there to Belgium or Holland to put another temporary grave. A lot of these bodies were put in several temporary graves before they got in, remains got put in the casket. And by that time, two years after the war, you know, the remains are bones and, and that's when they get it in the caskets and sent home that way. Not like the wars now where they put a dress them in a uniform and embalm them and send them home. No way. But if you go over there, just think when you look at those cemeteries and if you see 5,000, 7,000, 8,000 graves, that's only 40% of what was there. In Holland, there's 8,300 buried there. Uh, in, in Belgium, there's two cemeteries. In Luxembourg, there's one cemetery. In Italy, there are two. In France, there are about eight or nine. I've been to all of the permanent cemeteries. I've gone over there every five years from the 50th anniversary. Every five years I've been over there. And now to, to shoot this film that I did, I'm the only one I think that did a documentary. And uh, I took seven other D-Day veterans. I even flew a, a major general who was a ranger on D-Day, captain, and he lives in Florida. And uh, they flew him from Florida over with his physician, because he's had a couple of heart failures. He's about 97, uh, speaks very well. He's written a book called Intact about the invasion. We met him over there because he flew over there with his physician the day after us, and he only stayed four days because he wanted to be over there for a ranger reenactment and ranger ceremony, which we covered and interviewed him. And so uh, we had a variation of uh, veterans, paratrooper, combat medics, combat engineers. Uh, so we try to get a, a variation of, of uh, services. And uh, anyway, I, like I said, I, I've done, uh, in 2006, I started a 501c3, 100% nonprofit. I haven't re realized a dime from any of this. I was going to do one film, and it turned into six. And uh, 
I took young high school his, history teachers, four of them on the first film, and I took two other teachers on the second film, plus combat veterans. And I did a film about the 8th Air Force where I had uh, eight living members of the 8th Air Force, and, and most of them are dead now because I did that two years ago. I did a film about called They Will Never Forget, about people who put flowers on graves. They adopt graves of soldiers they never knew except for their liberators. And, and then the next film I did, uh, uh, the fifth film I did, was about the, the kids, German kids. Because after the war, I had to be in the Army of Occupation for seven months. And I saw these little kids that looked like our kids. They're hungry, forlorn, a lot of them are orphans. And so I thought, i got to go back there and do a film about the kids. So we got about 18 citizens between the ages of 76 and 86 who were kids during the war who brought pictures of when they were young. And they talked about the interaction they had with us, the American soldiers. And that's uh, a very heartwarming film to hear how, how they spoke about us. Uh, and uh, that film is a picture of me holding a little two-year-old German girl on the cover of the DVD and, and my, my Jeep with little kids in my Jeep. That was the fifth film. And then I told you about the sixth in Normandy. And I've talked to thousands of kids in, in California high schools, primarily high schools, in France and Belgium, uh, from special needs kids and, and grammar school kids to high school to college. So I, I've spoken to a lot of people. And, and, and here's my, my thing. My thing is a high price of freedom. And I saw the high price of freedom, just like other guys doing the job I did, and just like combat medics. We saw what it was like. I mean, when you see thousands of guys your age and a little bit older in every condition you can imagine, you don't forget it. And so when, when you hear these words, the high price of freedom, you think about the high price of freedom because we saw it. So anybody that saw it is never going to forget what they saw. I've heard about a lot of veterans who didn't want to talk about the war for quite a while afterwards. Uh, you mentioned 50 years was the first time you were back. And from what I've read, you didn't talk about it much. Uh, you told me beforehand that your kids hadn't heard you talk about it until the, you, you took them over there. Was it because there were memories of the work that you did that you just didn't want to think about? For a lot of reasons, actually. First of all, you know, a lot of guys never went back because they didn't want to re relive that. I had a chance to go to the 40th. I didn't want to relive it. I didn't want to go. Uh, I w my wife was still uh, living then. But then, you know, I went with my uh, late wife eight years before we got married, never talked to her about it. We got 13 years married, never talked to her about it. The kids never talked to her about it. You don't want to relive what you saw. And then the other reason is you're just one of thousands of other guys that did the same thing that you did, or maybe worse. And, and so... It's no big deal, you know. It's it's something that, that so many thousands of other guys did. And we lost four, over 400,000 guys in World War II, which is a whole lot of guys. But when you think about what the Russians and the Germans lost, I mean, <laughs> a lot, a lot more. The price of freedom is very high. It's not only high for us, but it's high for our allies and our enemy. And uh, these little kids that I went back to talk to these people after they're grown, I mean, they're just like us, you know. They went through the same thing and even worse because they, they had to duck the bombs. You know, a lot of their family members were killed. You know, we didn't have that situation here. Nobody here was killed from the enemy. So they had some, some tough times, and they were just regular people. And... Uh, you know, I never thought that I would do what I did after the war, but I had a German girlfriend. And uh, and I talked about it to all these young people the other day. And I says, she was on a flying trapeze with her sister and another girl. And we had a platonic relationship and everybody broke into laughter. You know, I remember I used to tell you guys, oh, I met a gal. She was in a circus. Oh, the bearded lady. You know, no, not the bearded lady. I had. This beautiful girl was on a flying trapeze. She was four months older than I was. And uh, I still have pictures of her out in the garage that I got to dump one of these days. 
But anyway, and then I had this Jeep. And I got to tell you about the Jeep. If sure. I can, you got it out, leave it in. But what happened was after the war, I, was, uh, I had to maintain a warehouse where all these units are going home out of turn and all their gear, everything, even medical, morphine, you name it. Nobody was into drugs then. You know, the morphine, nobody got take took the morphine. But across the road was a vehicle collection yard. A guy came over one day and said, George, could you give me a pair of paratrooper boots? Everybody wanted paratrooper boots. So I said, sure. Can you give me a Jeep? Kidding me out. He said, sure. So he gave me a Jeep. For seven months, I had a Jeep. Had her name stenciled on the bumper. I used to work one day on, one day off. And she was in Mannheim, Germany, went to Heidelberg, Heil, Heilbronn, Karlsruhe, Stuttgart. I followed her around and finally took her home to Frankfurt. But, but, and I finally met her father, who was a POW, had been released. But that wasn't until after I left Mannheim to get shipped out. And, but getting back to the Jeep, one day I forgot to lock it up with a chain. And these guys that kept wanting to borrow it, they took it out. They got drunk in an accident. Towed the vehicle into the yard. Company commander, they have to tell the company commander where they got me. So they come to me and say, you know, we had to tell them where we got it. So, okay. So then he chews me out. You know, where'd you get this Jeep? Don't you have stolen the military equipment? It's very serious. I said, well, sir, I just borrowed it. I didn't steal it. I didn't go over very well. <laughs> but anyway, he said, I got to think about this overnight. Next day he calls us in. He looks at me. Because of your age and because of what you did for 11 months in the war, I'm going to look the other way. Sterling Carpenter, never forget his name. Anyone else, you know, I could have been in Leavenworth or stolen. So I used to put, you know, go to the gas dumps and put my own gasoline and make out all my pa- I didn't have a driver's license. You're supposed to have a military driver's license. So anyway, after that, shipped out. I'm Bremerhaven, and uh, it's in December. We all wanted to get home for Christmas. No way we're going to get home for Christmas unless you get on the Queen Mary. Everybody went AWOL, and I got on a train. You had to carry your rifle with you, and that sling down, you know, barrel down, and uh, and uh, my overcoat over it. That is not, that's pretty cold, you know, we're in December. And so uh, I get on a train, and I go 350 miles to Frankfurt for Christmas. So I spent Christmas uh, with her and her sister, her mother and father, and I took her to, to an American movie, had her father's overcoat on, and my rifle <laughs> hanging down. It was a tearful uh, uh, parting because uh, uh, she went to the train station with me, and it was raining, and got in one of these telephone booths looking at each other, you know, and uh, with tears. And so here comes the train. Now, it was a movie. Here I am walking backwards to the train and waving to her goodbye. Yeah, it was very powerful because it, it was it, you know it was really good for me because I got a chance to chill out for seven months and uh, with this girlfriend and uh, and something. If I had gone home right away, I probably would have been a mess, you know. And my sisters told me I used to have nightmares. I don't remember a nightmare, but I came home. All I wanted to do is raise hell, go out and have a beer. Because I, I was when I got home, I was 20 and a half, and I couldn't buy a drink in California. So we have to get people to buy beer for us. So we run around chasing girls, and I did that for two years and decided to go to college. Then I went to junior college first because I hated high school. Then I went to junior college because I didn't know if I'd like college, and I loved it. And uh, and then uh, I then I went to University of Southern Cal. You know, I could go on and on and on, talk to you all day, but but I wanted to do documentaries to teach people about the high price of freedom. With these kids in high school, you know, you, you got to keep it kind of light at times and joke with them, you know, and, and so it's not all serious, you know. You keep their attention. Once in a while, you see a kid sleeping head on the desk, and you go over and touch them on the head and say, hey, didn't you have enough sleep last night? The teacher loves that, you know. But uh, you know. what, what's the moment like for you when they get it, when they understand the price of freedom oh. and to know that you oh, help yeah. them understand? Oh, it? yeah. You know, th- that's happened a lot where you really get to these kids. Some of them are in ROTC, you know, where I live in Palm Springs. I've, 
I've talked to kids at ROTC there a couple of times. When I go home, from now on, I'll, I'll be no more documentaries. It's too hard to raise the money. I had to work real hard doing those documentaries. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking to kids. Uh, and I'll be t- in my area, Coachella Valley, is a lot of high schools down there. And all these kids are ROTC. And, and those kids in particular, you, you really get to them. And uh, once in a while, you'll see a, a, a kid with tears. And uh, I'll ask them, hey, you know, they'll say sometimes, what can we do? And I said, well, you know, when you see a serviceman or woman out there, go up and shake their hand and thank them. I said, how many of you would volunteer? And I asked them. Once in a while, you get a kid to put the hand up. Once I got a girl to put her hand up one time. I said, you, you might get a, a, a bonus sign-up bullets, but would you do that and risk your life? You know, so I impress them as much as I can with the, the, the guys and gals that are out there now, because without them, what will we do? And looking at all these kids that I spoke to yesterday, there were hundreds of them there in that auditorium. Boy, they were quiet listening. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's good for them to hear this. And, uh. I wish there were more guys doing it. I belong to an organization called Freedom Committee of Orange County. It's got about 100 veterans of all wars that speak to uh, the kids in high school. And uh, actually, this high, one particular high school, Corona Del Mar, right near the coast, uh, they do a great program for about 27 years now where the kids, the sophomore class, gets involved with interviewing veterans, and they do a project on it. And... Uh, and it's really interesting what they do. And then after that, about a month or two later, you go to the auditorium where there's a hundred of these veterans and the, and, the, and the kids that interview them. You should have three or four kids come out and interview you. And um, and the kids are there and they introduce you and, uh, and you don't talk. They just, because too many. And they do a great program. They start off with the Star Spangled Banner and everything, you know, somebody singing. Uh, it's a great program. More schools should do that. Uh, it really gets the kids in where they have to do uh, some work on, on a part of the war you were in, what you did, and then they give you a copy, and they also tape it. They give you a, a, it's really worthwhile, you know. There's too many kids that don't know anything. I was in a, in a, a little uh, hamburger place with a friend of mine one day. And I don't know. I don't even remember who the heck it was now, but we got talking about Normandy. The little kid with his father sitting over here in the next booth. And he said, hey, uh, were you guys in Operation Overlord? And I said, what? What do you know? That's the code name. You know, right, for sure. sure. And I said, what do you know about that? He said, study it in school. I said, are you kidding? Where? A Lutheran school. My kids were what they call gate students. They had college courses and all. They knew nothing about the wars. I mean, talking about World War II or Korea or Vietnam. They didn't know anything. And uh, so when we got over there for the 50th, and my son looks at me, Dad, you didn't tell us anything about this because on, on the bus we had to talk about our experience landing there in Normandy. And so my kids were hearing this for the first time. There, I've had some very emotional times. Uh, I've even broken down talking to other GIs. I spoke to 3,000 people that have, people at American Airlines uh, one, one time. And uh, they have a big program they do there every year to raise funds for wounded warriors. American Airlines is really great with veterans, and they, they, they've been very good for me in four of my films. And Gary Sinise is a good friend. He's donated money twice for, to me. And uh, I've gone with him in American Airlines for the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And he was on that plane helping the... the Flight attendants serve food. We all had first class food. But he's a great guy. He's for real. And so I have one of the rare 100% nonprofits. Check out my website and uh, you'll see the five films I've done. What's you'll, the website? It's called Let Freedom Ring for All.org. F O R. I'll give you a card. F O R. Let Freedom Ring for All. Uh, and, and the reason why I say let freedom ring for all, because we, at least I thinking this way, that we weren't fighting this war just for ourselves. We were we were freeing a lot of people. Absolutely. 
And, and so that's what I mean, freedom for all. He, he, I had a German mayor tell me he's adopted three graves at Irish Chappelle Cemetery, and he got these citizens, German citizens, together for me that were kids during the war. And uh, in, in, in the film, he talks about how people should adopt these graves, regardless of you are the enemy or what. He says, uh, and, it, and uh, what he told me, he says, you know, you guys didn't, just defeat Germany, you got our freedom back. Right. I've heard, you know, the, I've heard the Dutch do heard that, that too. Before? I've heard the Dutch take uh, sponsor graves too. The Dutch are fantastic. There's 8,300 graves there in, in, in Holland, and they get about 300 people a day, Dutch people, that visit those graves. And every grave has been adopted because what a few of these cemeteries do, uh, they have a they have an organization where you adopt a grave, you get a certificate. I adopted a grave myself you know, with another guy because I'm not there to put flowers there uh, with a Dutch person. Uh, he, he's co-adopter with me. But he's Dutch, but he's adopted graves in, in Belgium and France. Some of the guys, young guys, they do this. They have websites. And what they do is they, 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 get, they find a family member or through a newspaper, they get a picture of the veteran. How old was he? You know, where did he go to school? Is he married? Did he get any kids? So they do history. It's mm-hmm. the only way anybody knows anything about these people. And in, in, in Holland, they have uh, pictures right there at the grave sites of the soldier. It's fantastic. Mr. Champa, sadly, our time is up. Thank you, sir, very much for your time with us today, and especially for your service to our country. You're welcome. Thank you. George Champa is a U.S. Army veteran of World War II, served with the 607th Graves Registration Company, served at Normandy, served in the Bulge as well, and other places in the Western Theater of Europe. I'm Greg Columbus, reporting for Veterans Chronicles.